until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter, says Chinua Chibe. Towards this goal, we have gathered to listen to an eminent speaker, Professor Prasanna Odipika, amongst us, to educate us on post-colonial literature. A successful event always begins with a heartful prayer. I now request Bharat to render the invocation, please. Thank you. Gajavadana beduve Gauri tanaya Gajavadana beduve Gauri tanaya Trijagavandi tane Sujanara porevane Trijagavandi tane Sujanara porevane Gajavadana beduve Gauri tanaya Gajavadana beduve Pashankushadhara Parama pavitra Mushika vahana Munijana prema Mushika vahana Munijana prema Gajavadana beduve Gauri tanaya Trijagavandi tane Sujanara porevane Gajavadana beduve Mudadi ninnaya padava toro Sadhu vanditane adara dindali Mudadi ninnaya padava toro Sadhu vanditane adara dindali Sarasijanabhashri purandara vithalana Sarasi jana bhashri purandara vithalana Nirutan, nirutan ene yuvante nidaya maado Nirutan ene yuvante nidaya maado Gajavadana beduve gauri tanaya Gajavadana beduve Gauri tanaya Trijagavandi tane Sujanara porevane Trijagavandi tane Sujanara porevane Gajavadana beduve 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 Thank you very much Bharat May I now request our Madam Principal, Dr. Y.C. Kamila, to deliver her, her welcome speech and introduce the Chief Guest, please. Good morning. Not enough. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, this is the chorus. <laughs> At the outset, I am very happy for conducting this program on behalf of English department on the topic post-colonial literature lens for life after foreign rule. It is really, really a very interesting subject. Okay. Why you may ask? The resource person will explain because I should not go into the topic. <clears throat> the entire community, Indian community, was affected by the colonial period. The thought process was also affected. You can say both in positive and negative side. Both the sides are there. It is not only in India, wherever the colonies were established, and of course, we do have positivities in that. Kannadalli navya navyotra adella borodake adu help it. So that was during colonial period itself. Post colonial ali yena la badlamane gada aitho na thena. Nijwa ko tumbha interesting topic na nige do. Purti vandhante 
ಕಳೆಯೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಪ್ರಯತ್ನ ಪಡ್ತೀನಿ ಇವತ್ತು ಈ ಒಂದು ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸವನ್ನು ನಡೆಸ್ಕೊಡೋದಕ್ಕೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಜೊತೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತಿ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಪ್ರಸನ್ನ ಉಡುಪಿಕರ್ ಅವರಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಅಟ್ ವಿ ವಿ ಎ ಡಿಗ್ರಿ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ವಿ ವಿ ಎನ್ ಅಂದರೆ ವಾಣಿ ವಿಲಾಸ ಡಿಗ್ರಿ ಕಾಲೇಜು ನಮ್ಮ ಬಸವನಗುಡಿ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಪಕ್ಕನೇ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಮೆಟ್ರೋ ಇದ್ರ ಕೆಳಗಡೆ ಇದೆ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ತುಂಬ ಹಳೆಯ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅದು ಇಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆಫ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ಟು ಏಯ್ಟಿ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ನೋ ವೆದರ್ ಯು ನೋ ಇಟ್ ಮರಾಠ ಮಂಡಲ ಅಂತ ಇತ್ತು ಹಿಂದೆ ಅದು ನಿಮ್ಮ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಇದನ್ನು ಆ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ಮೆಂಟನ್ನು ಈ ವಿ ವಿ ಎನ್ ಅವ್ರು ತೊಗೊಂಡು ನಡೆಸ್ಕೊಂಡು ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ದ ಫೇಮಸ್ ಪರ್ಸನಾಲಿಟಿ ಸುಲೋಚನಾ ಗುಣಶೀಲ ಸ್ಟಡೀಡ್ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ದ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸುಲೋಚನಾ ಗುಣಶೀಲ ವಾಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಓಲ್ಡ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಪ್ರೈಮರಿ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ವೇರ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾವು ಹೋಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಪ್ರಸನ್ನ ಉಡುಪಿಕರ್ ಇಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಮಂಗಳೂರು ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ವರ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಶಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅರ್ ಎಮ್ ಎ ಎಮ್ ಫಿಲ್ ಪಿ ಜಿ ಡಿ ಲಿಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಇನ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಶಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಪುಟ್ ಇನ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ತ್ರೀ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸರ್ವಿಸ್ ಓಕೆ ಆಲ್ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಮೋರ್ ದನ್ ತ್ರೀ ಡೆಕೇಡ್ಸ್ ಶಿ ಈಸ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಟೀಚಿಂಗ್ ಪಾಠ ಎಲ್ಲರೂ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ನಾವು ಕೆಲಸಕ್ಕೆ ಬಂದಮೇಲೆ ಪಾಠ ಮಾಡಲೇಬೇಕು ಇಪ್ಪತ್ತು ಗಂಟೆ ಅದರ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಬೇರೆ ಏನು ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಅನ್ನೋದು ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಟೂ ತ್ರೀ ಡೆಕೇಡ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಯುಮ್ಯುಲೇಟಿವ್ಲಿ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಆ್ಯಡೆಡ್ ಅಪ್ ಟು ಅವರ್ ಸಿ ವಿ ಸಿ ದ ಸಿ ವಿ ಕುಡ್ ಹವ್ ಬೀನ್ ಶಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ತ್ರೀ ಡೆಕೇಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಬಟ್ ಇಫ್ ವಿ ವರ್ಕ್ ಇನ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಡೈಮೆನ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ದ ಸಿ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಬಿಕಮ್ ರಿಚ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಮ್ಯಾಡಮ್ಸ್ ಸಿ ವಿ ಈಸ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪರ್ಟ್ ಕಮಿಟಿ ಫಾರ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಕರಿಕುಲಮ್ ಡೆವಲಪ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಎಜುಕೇಷನ್ ಪಾಲಿಸಿ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಮೆಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಬಿ ಆರ್ ಸಿ ಅಡ್ವೈಸರಿ ಕಮಿಟಿ ಸೆಂಟ್ರಲ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಕಲಬುರ್ಗಿ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಕನ್ವೀನರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಕಮಿಟಿ ಫಾರ್ ಡೆಮೋಗ್ರಾಫಿಕ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ವಿಜುವಲಿ ಚಾಲೆಂಜಡ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರು ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಎ ವೆರಿ ಹೈಲೈಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಹರ್ ಸಿ ವಿ ಶಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ವರ್ಕ್ಡ್ ಅ ಲಾಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ವಿಜುವಲಿ ಚಾಲೆಂಜಡ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಶಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ವರ್ಕ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ರೈಲ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಬುಕ್ ಕಮಿಟಿ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಬೋರ್ಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಸಿಟಿ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಅವರ್ ಬೋರ್ಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಟೋನಮಸ್ ಜಯನಗರ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಶಿ ಈಸ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಅದರ್ ಕಾಲೇಜಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಆಸ್ ಅ ರಿಸೋರ್ಸ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಶಿ ಹಸ್ ಡೆಲಿವರ್ಡ್ ಮೋರ್ ದ್ಯಾನ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಅಟ್ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಸೆಮಿನಾರ್ಸ್ ಚೇರ್ಡ್ ಅ ಸೆಷನ್ ಅಟ್ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಸೆಮಿನಾರ್ ಆನ್ ಪೋಸ್ಟ್ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಡಿಬೇಟ್ಸ್ ನೇಷನ್ ರೇಸ್ ಜೆಂಡರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕಲ್ಚರಲ್ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಟಿ ಅಟ್ ವಿ ಇ ಟಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಗ್ರೇಡ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಆನ್ ನೈನ್ತ್ ಮಾರ್ಚ್ ಟು ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಏಯ್ಟೀನ್ ಶಿ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ವೈಟೆಡ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ ಅಟ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಸೆಮಿನಾರ್ ಆನ್ ಉಮನ್ ಎಂಟರ್ಪ್ರನರ್ಶಿಪ್ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಎಂಟರ್ಪ್ರನರ್ಶಿಪ್ ಎಟ್ಸೆಟ್ರಾ ಶಿ ವಾಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಅ ಕೀನೌಟ್ ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಶಿ ಹಾಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಡೆಲಿವರ್ಡ್ ಕೀನೌಟ್ ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಅಟ್ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಸೆಮಿನಾರ್ ಆನ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಅಸ್ ಎ ಗ್ಲೋಬಲ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಡೋ ಏಷ್ಯನ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೆನಿ ಅದರ್ ಕಾಲೇಜಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ
She is the best outgoing student of her university when she was, she has backed that. That needs your applause as a student. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Madam Prasanna Udupikar is also Green Ambassador. See, where is English literature? Where is Green Ambassador? <laughs> green Ambassador contributing her share along with her students in saving environment and helping the rag pickers to earn a livelihood. Okay. Madam, your CV is really inspiring. It is really inspiring. You have shown how an individual rooted in a single subject can associate in multidimensional ways. So this is a, even before her lecture, this is the first inspiration that all of you will get from Madam Prasanna Vadapikar. Madam, we are very happy. When we invited her, we, uh, she accepted our invitation and she has graced the occasion on behalf of National Education Society of Karnataka, on behalf of National College of Jainagara, all the staff member and head of the department and the students, it is my pleasure to welcome you for this program. The program is organized by Department of English. I extend warm welcome to head of the department, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, and all the staff members of Department of English. The program is for you. It is for you to give a different experience. What UGC wants, if you have studied UGC uh, uh, literature, the UGC wants the students at higher education to get various dimensions of learning experience. You must learn in, on one side in classroom, on other side in, by innovative methods, thirdly by activity method, okay, and from resource persons, okay, as part of that and also if, whether the UGC says it or not, as a student you must get different experience when you are learning a particular subject. As a college, it is our duty to showcase you for various dimensions of learning. As part of that, that pro this program is organized for you. You are the most important. You have turned up for the occasion. I welcome you all for this program. Okay. I wish all the best for this program. Now, we shall listen Post-colonial literature, lens for the life after foreign rule. Foreign rule. Now, over to Madam. Thank you. What an impressive repertoire indeed. Thank you, Madam Principal, for the welcome speech and the introduction. May I now request our HOD, Head of the Department, Dr. Chinta Vijayalakshmi, to render her vote of thanks, please. Good morning, one and all present here. On behalf of the Department of English, I would like to, I deem it a privilege to propose word of thanks on this occasion. First of all, my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Prasanna Woodipeaker, Vice Principal of VVN Degree College, for being with us to enlighten our students with the topic post-colonial literature today. Thank you, ma'am. I must thank our beloved principal, Dr. Y.C. Kamala, for her support and encouragement to conduct such seminars or the guest lectures for the progress of the department. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to thank all my dear colleagues, Professor Chitra, Professor Varlakshmi, Professor Rajani Ravindra, Professor Nandini Madhusudan for all their support and cooperation to conduct this program and to make it a success. Thank you one and all. I thank Mr. Asif for the technical support that has been extended to conduct the same. Last but not the least, I thank all the students of Optional English for their active participation in today's program. Thank you. 
I would also like to thank our beloved head of the department, Dr. C. Vijayalakshmi, who had the vision for the department on for the students. So thank you, ma'am. The moment has come now. May I now call upon our guest speaker, Professor Prasanna Udipika, to render her speech, please. Thank you very much. Very good morning to all of you. Morning, very good morning. Good morning yes, thank you. At the very outset, let me express my gratitude to the principal of this prestigious college, the National College of Jainagar, and my friend, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, HOD of English department, and IQAC coordinator of this prestigious college, and all the department faculty members for giving me an opportunity to interact with optional English students. When compared to general English students, you study English, not just as a language, but you study English as literature. And hence, your status quo is little higher. I felt very happy when I was invited so that I got a chance to discuss, to deliberate on this topic, especially post-colonial literature, which we find it very relevant and which is the need of the art to study the text which come under post-colonial literature. Now, My deliberations on post-colonial literature today would comprise these points, that is post-colonial definition and meaning, post-colonial literary theory, post-colonial theorist, post Indian English post-colonial literature, the features, post-colonial Indian English writers, the films which come under, which have been transformed into uh, texts which have been transformed into film and then post-colonial literature and its impact. Here we would study what is actually the objective of uh, post-colonial literature and how far it has been successful in inculcating the values that it aims at. <clears throat> now, let us know what post-colonial literature is. Post-colonial literature refers to the literature produced by the people who were who belonged to colonized country students when two cultures meet together usually what happens is one starts showing itself as superior and the other itself as inferior now going deep into this we shall first start studying the meaning of the word post-colonialism. Now post, the etymology, tracing back to the etymology of the word, post refers to the Latin word postus, which means after or behind. Colony, again, it has a root word in Latin language, colonus, a cultivator, a planter, a settler in a new world. So post-colonialism refers to the period after colonialism. Now what do we mean by settlers, settlement, etc.? Way back when the population was not as much as it is now, people used to move from one place to other. It could be in search of resources, it could be in search of climate, it could be in search of comfortability. Various reasons were there. They used to move from one place to other. Now, if you study the history of English language, there also you would know that in the Celtic, Celtic region, Angles came and settled, Saxons came and settled. Now, Angles and Saxons population increased, Celtic population was less, and it goes on like that, how uh, it's another, uh, we would need another session to study how this word English evolved, England, the word evolved, all this thing. Now again there, why I referred this as, it is all because of the settlers from some other place coming and settling here. 
Now the people used to move like this from place to place. They came and settled in one particular place. They found it very comfortable and they were also, now these people are called settlers. These people are colonizers. They settled in a place and that place is called settlement. When you study post-colonial literature, these are the words which you come across. Now there were already people who were living in that place. They are called natives. They are called aboriginals. They are called uh, primitive people. Now, the settlers came here, settled and started to administ started their administration. They considered the native people to be barbaric, savage, illiterate, unrefined, unsophisticated people who don't know anything, whereas they considered themselves to be very superior. Also in the name of religion, they took it to be their bounden duty to reframe and reform the natives. Rudyard Kipling writes in his novel, The White Man's Burden, that the white man is superior and they take it to be their burden to reform the natives. Students, the natives were not ready for this. They had their own language, they had their own culture. They, the, these settlers, the colonizers, they forced their language on them, they forced their culture on them. Now when such things happen, the experiences are not very happy experience. The experiences are very traumatic, the experiences are very painful. Now these experiences we study in post-colonial literature. Now the natives did not feel comfortable, they could not accept, they could not adjust the colonizers ways and they started to migrate. Now remember when they migrated, they did not migrate as administrators, they migrated as slaves, they migrated in search of work, they migrated as laborers. And then they started to write their experiences under colonizers. And hence, it came, these writings came in different forms, in diaries, in, as an article in papers, and all these things. And this is how post-colonial literature emerged. A person who is being colonized, speaking about his experience. But then it's not just speaking about his experience in post-colonial literature, what you also come across is the aftermath effect of colonization. The aftermath effect of colonization. How it has influenced the mind of the people, the language of the people and the culture of the people. Students, we all know that freedom is as important as air, as important as the food we eat, as important as the water we drink. If there is no freedom, we cannot enjoy life. You can recall the poem of John Keats, the poem, I had a dove, where he asks, he has a dove, he has kept it in a golden cage and he has also tied a silken thread which is woven by his own hands, the poet says, but the dove doesn't survive, it dies. And the poet says, I know that you died of grief, you grieved and died. What could be your grievance, he says. Daily I used to give you white peanuts. In the forest you were alone. Here I had given you all the comfortabilities. Yet you got suffocated and you died. What could be the reason, the poet wonders. So there is a message. The reason is the bird was deprived of freedom. So here also when, now we can take the best example as India. Hmm? India is a colonial colonized once upon a time, it was also colonized by Britishers. Almost 80 percent, now post-colonial uh, um, word is a global word. It refers to all the literature which is written by the people who belong to colonized country. 
not just uh, uh, countries which were colonized by Britishers. For that you have another word, commonwealth literature, that is different. Now here it is post-colonial, it refers to any literature, it could be uh, uh, a novel written by an African, it comes under this. So their experiences were so traumatic that when you read Toni Mar Morrison's, I am sure that you might have had her uh, uh, stories in your uh, textbook, Toni Morrison, Morrison's uh, uh, story, Sweetness especially, there she writes, even in her autobiography, she unravels the traumatic experiences that Negroes, the black people, the African had under the white people. The white considered themselves to be superior to such an extent that even during a marriage, even in the church, if the Negro couple went to get married, there were old Bibles uh, kept for them to take the oath on it. And the Bible was torn, was uh, soiled, was very, very old. Whereas the Bible which was kept for white couple to come and take the oath was very fresh and new. So they treated them like dirt, she says. They treated them like dirt. We have Syed's um, uh, story where he says that there is a character, Mustafa, who says that Othello, Othello is a lie, he says. So the writer makes the character to tell Othello, there is no Othello, Othello is lie. Why? Because Othello, the play written by Shakespeare, there we see that a white lady loves him. There you see that the king respects him. There you see that the king makes him duke. Now Mustafa says, this cannot be possible. This is highly impossible because the black people are always considered as the other by the Americans, by the white people, by the English people. They are not considered to be us. Us is the word which is used only for English people. Other is the word used for black and brown, the Negro. So he says, it cannot be. If we read E.M. Foster's best example for post-colonial literature, A Passage to India, there towards the end, there is a dialogue between uh, Dr. Aziz and Mr. Fielding. Dr. Aziz is... The, the case is filed against him, a case is filed against him in the court of law when the Britishers were ruling during that time it is. And the woman, Adela, has filed a case because of his wrong behavior with her. Now when the case is filed, um, the Indians also divide into two. Some believe Dr. Ajij. Some feel that, what nonsense is this? Dr. Ajij could not resist himself from this white lady. So there is division. Dr. Ajij tries to convince them that he has not done anything. This is false case. Who is there to agree this or accept this? But finally what happens is in the very surprising uh, twist is there, Adela comes and tells, uh, she takes back the case. Hmm? She takes back the case. Then his friend Fielding says, even now we are friends, Dr. Ajiz says, not under the sky, not under the sky because they were ruled by white people and always the policies were discriminatory. So like this, when you read the stories, which the text which come under post-colonial literature, you would, it slowly unravels you the traumatic experiences that Indian English writing, if you take, Indians experienced under British rule. Hmm? There also you come across that. Now, uh, we have discussed how this emerged, that when these people went and settled in other place, they started to write about their experiences. Yes. Students, here it is. Now let us see, is it a curse or a blessing? Can we consider it to be a curse or can we consider it to be a blessing? Some would consider it to be even today, there are people who would say, oh, Britishers have introduced this education system, so good it is. Britishers have done this 
roads. Britishers have built uh, railroads and all that. So here it is. No doubt they had contributed to the infrastructure, trade, medical facilities, technologies. They also helped in establishing democratic system. But do you think it was all for it? Do you think it was for Indians to prosper and develop? Not at all. Not at all. When they made railroads, many of the Indians died while making the railroads. The facilities were, were not as much as they are now. They made the railroads in order to Yes, transport all the resources that they found here in India to through the port, through the ship, to their land. One more thing what you have to remember here is, the settlers who came settled in the settlement area, colonial place, they had their connections with their motherland. They continued to send the profit that they made here in this colonized place to their motherland. So what happened in due course? Indians lived poorer and poorer. They were made to starve. All the resources were taken away by them and Indians were helpless. The rail, when they made the rails, railroads, students, first class compartment, there was the board. Dogs and Indians are not allowed to travel in this compartment were built by the Indians, by the taxes paid by or extracted by the Indians and this was the board. They did not allow. How much money you had, you might have taken. Now the same experience Gandhiji experienced in South Africa. Uh, you know, uh, classic example we can recall. Then he realized The colonized people. So here also in India the same thing happened. Education system, we think that oh this is a very good education system that is given by Britain. Now do you think that it was done with a good intention? No. If you read the minutes of education of 1835 or 38 by Macaulay, there you read that Macaulay has said we have got to teach English to Indians who would act as a bridge between the Britishers and the Indians. They wanted to create a babus. They wanted to uh, have people who can translate the language, not ready to learn Hindi language or any Indian language. They wanted them to translate it, it into English language. So, though they did all these things, we cannot consider it to be Coming on to this curse, why do we consider it to be a curse? Because they treated us as the slaves, they treated us as laborers. They, there was ra racism, racial discrimination, black and brown. We, 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 we also are treated as black people, they treated black people. We are also treated in the same way. Here. Dehumanization that those people endured, they sold them as slaves, they used them to fight in the world wars. White culture, education, religion were imposed against their will. Many people were asked to change their religion into Christianity. It was a force. That is why we have many Christian, uh, I mean the religion has many people. Just in India, 80% I have told you that the world was colonized. The world was colonized. And there they made people forcibly uh, accept Christianity. Do you think those people who changed their religion to the other religion were happy and accepted there? For that you have to read Bama. Post-colonial literature, it comes under. If you read her autobiography, Kuruku, then you will know she, is, she belongs to untouchable category. And she says that dreaming of a better life, she changed her religion. And then what 
was appalling to her was that even there in that religion there was discrimination. They never accepted her to be along with them as they are, but a converted person, converted from some other religion. So these converted people are not accepted actually, they again have a different clan there. That is why we have Christians and then Protestants. Now these converted people have their own rules there. They can mingle, get their children married into their own clan, not to people who are Christians. Now all these rules. So she unravels all these things. Students, as the teacher told um, in the beginning, I think I have put that uh, sentence here also, until the lion learns how to write, Every story will glorify the hunter. It will glorify the hunter. Hunter will think that he is superior and he can kill the lion. The lion keeps quiet. Once the lion starts roaring, the hunter will run away. This is what happened with the colonized people. When they started writing profusely about their experiences and uh, they wrote in English. Now the question arises. Why did they write in English? They could have written in their own language. It is a colonized language, colonial's language. Sorry, colonial's language. Why did they write? Yes, there is a reason. If they had written in their own mother tongue, it wouldn't have reached the mass. It wouldn't have reached the people in other countries. English. Because English people colonized the other countries also, they had known this English language. Today we keep telling in English is international language and it has gained a supreme position. It is a must for us now. It is all because of this. And they start to write. When they start to write, people realize they became motivated. You have to speak, no? When you have some problem, unless and until you speak, others will not come to know of it. And you cannot get a solution also. So speaking is very important, writing is very important, expression is very important. So colonized people started to write and this led to a massive struggle and decolonizing. And now that, that again you have to study history. Now let us see here, post-colonial theory, there are theories under post-colonial Literature. A common question which I come across usually is, why can't we read a text as a text? Is it necessary to study these theories? Is it necessary for us to apply Marxist theory, structuralist theory and other theory to a text? Some say if we apply the theories, we are going to demean the text. We are going to degrade the text. We are going to narrow down the text. No, it is not that. If you apply, it is very essential for us to know the theories in order to understand the concepts, the situations that have been expressed by the writer. If a character says this, some dialogue, why does it say like that? For example, Maya and poem also you might have studied somewhere in the text. I still rise. I still rise and I still rise. It's not just I still rise and I still rise. Conjunction is there. Look at that conjunction that she uses and I still rise. Now when you look at the uh, title itself, then you wonder what is this and I still rise. Why does she say that and I still rise? So you have to study the background, hmm? background of the author the text when it was written and what was the condition of the Africans then. Only then it will be um, possible for us to understand the text very well. To give you a better example, my professor when I was doing my PG, Dr. CNR, he stays here in Bangalore and a very great critic and he recently also he was, um, he, he was awarded with the Kannada Sahitya Parishat Award and uh, many other accolades he has got a great writer. Now he had shared his experience with us then. He had said that to understand any text, it is where it quite essential to know the background, the cultural, political, social, economical, etc. 
setting of the text, when it was written and how it was, the society was. He gave his, uh, he spoke, he shared his experience that once uh, when he had been abroad, uh, he was asked to teach the text samskara, you are Anantamurthy's samskara. Okay? You might have read it and there is also a movie, uh, Girish Karnad plays the lead role, samskara. And in that, there are many issues. One issue is this, that this, he is a priest, Pranesh Acharya he is. There is an illegal relationship with a woman who belongs to lower caste. The entire community bans him. He cannot even enter the temple. The story goes like this. The students did not have any impact at all. The students were looking quite confused. And one of the student, students got up and asked the professor, what's the big thing here? Keeping his pocket, uh, palm in the pocket, he asked, what's the big thing here? A man had an illegal relationship with a woman. What's new there? What's strange? Now, how will he know that in India, virginity, celibacy, all these things are considered to be very, very important. Very, very important. We are the worshippers of Lord Rama. Eka patni vritastahi is. So, there, is, there are values attached to this. So, the professor said, it was very difficult because in their culture, that's not a big matter at all. That's not a big matter at all. Hence, it is very essential for us when we study, if we pick up an African poem or a poem, uh, a novel written by an African writer, then it is very essential for us to know the backdrop of the novel. Only then it will be possible for us to understand it in a better way. Now, let us see the theories of post-colonial literature. There are many theorists, well-known theorists. I'll uh, concentrate only on three here because of paucity of time. Bill Ashcroft. Uh, okay. Now, uh, let us uh, discuss about what the theory actually aims at. Post-colonial theory, what does it aim at? It aims at XP, it aims at the variety of experiences of colonized people, migration, slavery, suppression, resistance, representation, difference, race, gender, place, responses to the influential master discourses of imperial Europe, such as history, philosophy, linguistics, and the fundamental experiences of speaking and writing by which all these come into being. None of these, uh, don't think that all should be there in post-colonial text which you take up for, uh, uh, for study, but then one of these should be there. This is, uh, these are the things which the theory aims at. Now, post-colonial criticism emerged as a distinct category only in 1990, late 20th century, through the influential books such as, and they became the theorists, Orientalism, written in the year 1978 by Edward Saith, in other words, 1987 by Guy Pivok, The Empire Writes Back, written in 1989 by Bill Ashcroft, Nation and Narration, written during 1990 by Homi K. Baba. These are theorists, critical theory they formed. What did they do? They analyzed the post-colonial texts. Now, when you study Orientalism by Edward Said, he was a professor also, you come across the words East and West. Oriental and Occidental. You come across the word others. You come across the word us. So East, mainly here it refers to Muslims because he is referring to those countries. And he says, they were also discriminated when they were ruled by the Europeans. Europeans used the word other 
for them, outsider for them. Whereas for themselves, the word used was us. The word used was us. Because they always considered them to be superior. Now, these are the words. In, uh, when you study post-colonial uh, text, you would identify it. How we were treated as outsiders. Then we have Gayatri Spivok. She has introduced uh, many post-colonial theories through her books, Three Women's Texts and Critique of Imperialism. Can the subalterns speak? Subaltern are the people who are other, than the, uh, other from the mainstream. She speaks about sati system. She tells that a woman is identified by her husband. Her existence is connected with her husband. So when husband was not there, he died. She was forced for sati system. She was forced for sati system. So there was no identity at all. So women was marginalized to such an extent, double marginalized, marginalized by the imperial world, marginalized by the patriarch society. Students, when you study post-colonial literature, you will also come across the words imperialism. Now, imperialism is a stepping stone for colonization. Imperialism is a word which we refer to uh, those countries which used military force in order to colonize a country or conquer a country. That is imperialism. Now, Draupadi and many other uh, texts she has written. She has also, she has translated, written by Mahashweta Devi. Homi K. Baba, uh, in his book, Nation and Narration, he speaks about nation and nationalism. Under colonialism and post-coloniality. What were the thoughts? Now, the three important words that you come across here is hybridity, mimicry, and ambivalence. Now, hybridity, what is hybridity? Hybrid crop, hybrid, uh, um, all hybrid. We are also hybrid these days. Kanglish, uh, it is not Kannada, it has become Kanglish now. Hybrid. Once it so happened that a minister was asked to welcome a, um, a minister of another country. And that minister knew English. Uh, other than English, he did not know any other language. The minister will take it. For example, Karnataka. Okay. He went and he said, now how can I go to aerodrome and welcome him? Um, because I don't know English. I don't know English at all and I would be cutting a very sorry figure. This won't be proper. But then other officers all said, sir, it won't be proper. Hmm? You have to go as a minister and that's a respect and honor for him. Otherwise, it may lead to many other controversies. So you have to. We will teach you English. You don't worry. We will teach you English, workable English, what you have got to speak to that person. He agreed and he said, uh, they, they said, uh, sir, what you have to do is, when he comes, who are you? No, how are you? Hmm? Not who are you, how are you? You have to just shake, he will extend his hand, you have to shake his hand and say, how are you, how are you? And uh, he will also say, how do you do? You have to say, fine, thank you. Hmm? Fine, thank you. Yes, he start, learnt all these things. He went, the D-Day D -day came and the minister got down from foreign country and our minister was pushed forward with a bouquet and all, he went and he was so much confused and nervous because he was told that minister will come alone but minister had come with his wife. Hmm? The white lady, you know, she came like this and uh, this man was baffled. Oh, my English and uh, this lady, she may laugh and uh, he forgot the simple sentence, how are you? So the minister was surprised, this, what is this? This man is staring at my wife. And then uh, he extended his hand, this minister extended, looking at that lady, he asked, 
who are you who are you what was the word that he was asked to ask how are you then he said who are you who are you the minister was really confused what is the then he said um, i am her husband i am her husband he said then the next two words i forgot to tell you which was taught to him how are you he has to the uh, person would say i am fine and he would ask how are you and you have to say me too hmm? now here he said i am her husband and this minister said me too me too me too he said see this is what happens then the officers came and said sir uh, uh, there is a problem and uh, this is what then the minister said uh, no worries i'm going to stay here for three days let me learn your language to communicate with that minister it's okay it's fine i learn your language within a within a day or two he learned the language kannada language he learned and the minister said it's so easy to learn kannada language always surprised how he said it's almost english tableu <laughs> you have to just say kurchi do you say kurchi these days no cheru table mic light projector you have to use only you there u that's all it becomes kannada kannada language huh? table keep the table um, cheru idi that's all so what do we see here is hybridization of the language hybridization because of the influence of the culture culture of the colonizers the colonial people because the culture was also forced on them after the colonizers left the country they were lost they neither could follow their culture nor they could follow completely the colonizers culture it was all hybrid culture it was all hybrid now that is what we see today also there is lot of hybridization not only in language but also in our ways in our ways can you give any example here food also food and then ha huh? see english department colonial language we are teaching yes dress and all yes now hybridization you have learned another word which you come across that is the confusion between the cultures the language etc uh, homike baba speaks discusses in his theory then we come across mimicry mimicry is just uh, um, you know imitating the colonizers ways behavior dress language etc etc even today let me give you an example the other day uh, that is last month when i had been to my native place mangalore to attend a wedding scorching heat people were sweating like anything but i saw men wearing suit boot coat and all that it is western dress it's western dress. does it suit our climate it does not suit but we wear it why because we will be considered to be superior will be considered to be superior if you go to a function uh, they offer you food you use spoon why because you want to show that it is you are sophisticated refined so being sophisticated refined and all we relate it to the culture of colonizer we have adopted them considered them to be superior because they influence the psyche of the people also not just the language not just uh, uh, culture and other things but psyche of the people was also influence thinking thinking of the people i saw the other day in a hotel a man was struggling to eat dosa with the spoons is it possible no but he wants to show that he is very refined refined so mimicry now what are the problems that we are facing by imitating blindly the superior uh, the uh, colonial culture mimicry and then the word is ambivalence ambivalence is um, the situation which is created by the interaction between the um, colonize uh, colon colonial people or the colonizer and the colonized the colonizer always considered himself to be superior the colonized people always considered themselves to be very primitive barbaric savage 
and this is how there is this ambivalence created which is not true. Do you consider it to be true? No, it is not true. That is why I have put some pictures here which would show you those <coughs> the, the relationship between the post colonizer and the colonized. Coming to the features, okay. Now, what are the theories we have studied? Now, post colonial literature. What are the features that we come across post colonial literature? What are the issues that we come across there? First is identity. Lot of problem is there in our identity. We want to learn English because we want to equal ourselves with the Britishers or Europeans. What about the accent? Can we have that accent? No. In France, Fenon's uh, white man and black, black man and white mask, I am going to discuss it there. There, you come across a boy looks at his friend who is European and considers to be very superior the way he stood and the way he, uh, you know, threw his shoulders while talking and all, threw his hair and all that. This boy imitates him, thinking that he can be considered to be equal because he is a Negro person. And then everything he learns, walking style, talking style, everything. One day he stands in front of the mirror and sees himself. What does he see there? In spite of putting in lot of effort and learning all these things, what about the color of the skin? Has it changed? No. White man is white man. Black man is black man. It is very beautiful. If you get time, you read. So there is this identity, loss of identity or we can say it is search for identity. In the plays or novels that you read, in the literary text colonial literature. Then we have ethnicity. Ethnicity is the group, the culture of group of people, group of people. Caste identity, casteism which was very prevalent in India, four varanas we followed. This casteism you study in post-colonial literature. Nationalism, you study about otherness, how this feeling of inferiority is there in us when we confront the European people. Voice of Indian woman, hybridity we have discussed, voice of Indian diaspora. Diaspora is uh, diasporic literature we have. The literature of diaspora uh, refers to the literary texts which are written by the Indians who have settled, migrated from India and settled abroad. Now, they write about India and their experience, that is again entirely different. Okay? Now, this is what I was telling, important text. The first text post -colonial, under post-colonial literature is Black Skin and White Mask, written in the year 1958 by Franz Fenon. He was a psychiatrist also. So, he unravels the psychological impact, the pressure that the colonized people underwent, leaving apart the social, economical and uh, the other, uh, you know, uh, problems that they face. But this was more severe than anything else. Another book which he has written is A Dying Colo Colonialist, Colonialism. And then in 1961, this is also a very interesting book, uh, Wretched of the Earth. You must read it. Time is up or? Yeah. Little. <laughs> ten more minutes. That's all. The, yeah, ten more minutes. This is important text. I'm going to uh, show you. Um, that's all. Chinua Chibi's things fall apart. Is it introduced to you? Is it there as a text? Okay. Very wonderful uh, text. This is Okongo Igbo community. Uh, you would study there. Beautiful. I'm not going to speak about it because you lose interest when you study it. Now, some of the important uh, writers, Indian English writers, texts under post-colonial uh, Indian writing in English are R. K. Narayan, Kamala Markande, Swami and Friends, Nectar in Sieve, 
fault lines, Raja Rao, serpent and the rope, the tigers, um, tiger's daughter, all these are the writers. Then the films that are very important, which speak about the post-colonial um, features are Lagan and Rangde Basanti. These are also introduced in your text and you can have it. You can have a um, one and a half hour uh, discussion on these uh, uh, films. It's very beautiful. I'm not going to discuss in detail because you already have it in your syllabus. Now impact, the last point is impact of post-colonial literature. Finding a voice to reclaim the past identity. So what is the aim? Why did they write these texts? They write, wrote these texts in order to make the colonized people they realize their identity, their culture, to make them know that the practices that they are practicing now are not theirs, but they have been imbibed by their rulers. So they motivate the readers to go back to the roots, the original history, culture of the land. Students, I must tell you, even we have studied history only from the only from European invasion, yes or no? Have we studied our history, how India was before the Europeans came? What was the literature existed then? What were the languages and what did the people do? We had a literature, we had a language, we had our own culture and all that, uh, the temples and the mosques, all these things, uh, we, we are not given an idea of that, we think that history of a nation is only from the European, um, uh, European invasion, but it is not true. Now the post-colonial literature awakens the people to go back to the roots. This is not the root at all, it's not, a uh, nation is not just uh, studying from in, uh, European uh, uh, invasion, but it is studying from the root, how it was earlier, what were our practices. Today, because people are not aware of the greatness of our culture, they think that all these practices are, um, are what? Superstition. Because they are not aware how important it is. On small example students, shaking hand is not our culture at all when we meet. What is our culture? Huh. We, yes, we fold our hands and say namaskara. We keep a distance because those days people knew that if you touch and um, give shake hand and all, the germs, the infection may spread. Now COVID has taught us a lesson. Oh, no, 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 no. People won't uh, extend their hand, they say namaskara. Yes? Huh. Ah, yes, earlier. Uh, see, th this was our culture. This was our culture, but hybridization took place, mimicry took place, and that is why, mo this is one example, most of these examples. Now, there was a reason why they did namaskara, and why, you know, for everything there is a reason. Scientific reason is there. Because we don't know the scientific reason, we think that, oh, that's all old-fashioned, that is, you know, barbaric, that is being very um, savage, it is superstition and all, it is not like that. Now, post-colonial literature is trying to take us back to our roots, hmm? back to our roots. This, that is why it is very important and very interesting also, you should study the post-colonial text to know that our ideologies and our ideals in the past are really very great and we have got to value it. Yes. Now, I'll wind up. Before I wind up, I, I would uh, read out some of the lines from Maya Angelou's, my favorite poem, And Still I Rise, where she says that is, even though we have been colonized students, even though we are now following their system or whatever it is, because there is a history, why we have become like this or why we are following, there is a history. Now, these are the words which we should remember. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I will rise. She says that, out of the huts of history is a shame I rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I am black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise 
into a daybreak that's wondrously clear i rise bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave this is what i wanted to tell you we should never give up our culture our practices it we should learn it why we don't know the uh, today because even in our history or in our science book these culture or these practices have not been highlighted nor they have been taught that is why blindly we are following english culture here she says bringing the gifts of my ancestors gave i am the dream and the hope of the slave she says i rise i rise i rise students it is important for us to rise and accept our culture to be the great and follow it thank you thank you so much for giving me this opportunity this is one small video which should be played <laughs> ايما انا ما احبك انا ما احبك ايما شو بس ديروا لي شو بس ديروا لي ايما ايما شو بس ديروا لي ايما شو شو تم 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 انا ما فتحت واحد ما فتحت واحد I do not come with timeless truths. My consciousness is not illuminated with ultimate radiances. Nevertheless, in complete composure, I think it would be good if certain things were said. Lock me. Lock me. Lock me. These things I am going to say, not shout. For it is a long time since shouting has gone out of my life. So very long. I was born in 1925 in Martinique. I studied medicine in France and later specialized in psychiatry. When I was 27, I published my first book, Black Skin, White Mask. I write this book. No one has asked me for it, especially those to whom it is directed. Well, I reply quite calmly. There are too many idiots in this world, and having said it, I have the burden of proving it. The struggle between the master and the slave is a struggle for power, partly for who possesses the products of the slave's labor. This is the bit that interests Fano because he sees, of course, that the colonizer-colonized relationship is a struggle to the death, and indeed, in his life, he pursues it to the death. At the same time, he sees it is also a struggle by the slave to win recognition, and also the dependency of the master on the recognition from the slave. What Fano says is, in the colonized colonial relationship, there is no recognition going on. And that's why Fano is concerned that racism depersonalizes. It is a denial of recognition. It is the master saying, "I do not see you at all." It's just an excerpt from his uh, autobiography. Thank you, students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Professor Prasanna. It was a mesmerizing uh, lecture. You walked us through the etymology, through the authors, through the terminologies, and also it was a visual treat in the end. And you made it also very, you know, very interesting with your apt examples. Uh, and you introduced 
asked a lot of authors whom I would have missed in the class. I think we are all, uh, be, uh, teachers are also students in the end of the day. So we are really looking forward to more lectures, you know. I became a student after many, many years in my life. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you.